read out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, but uh, we asked you the question earlier, what are you looking for? What are you looking for today? Why did you come to church today? Did you come to church looking and expecting something, or you just came for the free donuts? <laughs> Either way, we're just happy to have you. Okay. Either way, uh, what are you looking for? You know, it seems like all of our life we are searching and looking for something, aren't we? Looking for stuff. It's like we're in that constant hunting mode, shopping mode. You're looking for one more pair of shoes. <laughs> Those perfect shoes that will make you taller, slimmer, and that you can walk in. That combination is hard to find. You're looking for that, you know, it's funny because last, uh, this last winter I was kind of shopping for a motorcycle, so I was on Marketplace, you know, and you're just kind of shopping, you're scrolling through, you got your free time, you get your phone out, and you're scrolling through, and, uh, and then you actually get one, but it's hard to break the habit. Once you get into that habit of scrolling and looking and searching, and so uh, there's some good deals out there. And my wife's like, no, no more, stop. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. But I also want to read out of verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. When you are looking for something now, some of you are so young, you, you don't, you've never really had a map. Uh, how, many, how many of you guys have ever navigated by a map? How many of you guys were able to refold it correctly so it would... It's great having Bill and Helen with us, friends from uh, Ankeny, and uh, Bill's the king of maps. Obviously, I see that he is... Uh, a, navigated, and, uh, you know, maps are tricky. So, um, the first thing that as we are looking for something, um, and some things are easy. Some things are easy to find, you know. It used to be, the, the saying was that all roads lead to Rome. That whatever road you were on, you would end up at Rome. But I'm just saying that all roads do not lead to Vandalia. <laughs> you know, uh, there, there's Vandalia Road, and I didn't realize what the deal was, but there actually is a town, Vandalia. Have you ever been there? Yeah, most of you have not, because there's one paved road going in and coming out, and there's about ten houses, and you come up into there, and uh, then there's a stop sign. They have a stop sign. But unless you turn around and go backwards, you're going to be going down a gravel road. And I would be curious to know if the map actually has Vandalia on it anymore. Because it's so small. But first of all, to have a map to find what you're looking for. All of us have, sorry, just had a random thought run through my head. I was going to say, all of us have something missing. <laughs> and I thought, how can I phrase that better? You know, a few bricks 
yeah, short of a load, you know. Uh, <laughs> Some are missing more than others, okay? We'll just go ahead and go there. But all of us have a missing piece. It's the God piece that's in our heart that we that we spend our entire life looking to fill that void, that gap. You know, it's interesting as you as you put that puzzle together and you get down to the end and there's a part in the middle and you cannot find that one piece. And you're taking this piece and that piece and you're trying to fit them in there, but they just don't fit. And there is a God part of us, all of us. We were created in His image. We were created to have a relationship with Him. We all need relationships. We talked about that last week. But to have a relationship with Him, He is what completes you. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The perfect outfit will not complete you. Yes. The perfect car, the perfect truck. You know, I talked to somebody the other day, and they had, in their job process, had been in a place where they couldn't really spend any money. Which, wow. So they have been able to accumulate a big chunk of money. And, and there's, a, there's, there's just a need to spend, isn't there? And uh, this person was sharing with me that their friend was a part of the same process, and their friend wanted to buy a new purse. How many of you ladies like getting new purses? Yes. Oh, yeah. It completes the ensemble. <laughs> Us guys got nothing. What do we get? Oh, boots. Okay, thank you. New, book, new pair of boots, I did, or a hat, or a new belt, and this, this young lady, she, she was looking at a new purse, and I don't know what you spent for purses, I try to keep mine under $100, <laughs> my wife tells me that there, you can spend four or five hundred, and, and this person was looking at a purse that they've always wanted, and, and it cost $6,000. And, and, and my thought was, I could buy a pretty nice motorcycle for that. <laughs> and you're like, wow. Do you know what? She's still going to have an emptiness and a hole inside of her because things don't fill the hole. A relationship with the Creator. And in fact, it's a. Uh, Having the, recognizing that there is a creator. You know, people struggle with that. Romans chapter 1 talks about the struggle that people have in grasping there is a creator, there is a higher power. You guys are in your church today because you believe there is a God, but not everybody does. But it says uh, that no one will be without excuse that God has given a map to find him to everyone. That people who say, I didn't know there was a God will be wrong. They will be totally, because in, and it says in Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. You know, it's interesting because I had a conversation just yesterday with a man who, uh, I don't know that he's even a believer, but we had the discussion about where we are as a nation today and, uh, and how that for the first 200 years, as a collective body, not everyone was believers, but everyone operated off the biblical standard. This was the standard. Whether you were a person of faith or not, this was still the standard. But in the past 40 years, the biblical standard has been thrown out. And now, 
Romans chapter 1 is so true. But it goes on and says, uh, they're suppressing the truth by their wickedness. They're attempting to, you know, and the Bible talks about when, when, when right is wrong. When, when, when what is right is called bad and what, what is wrong is glorified. You know that uh, people are saying, I won't go to this state or that state because they don't allow you to kill unborn children. No. I just, the heart of God is grieved. So it goes on and says, since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. When I talk to people and I, and I say to them, do you believe in a creator? Because it, it seems as if when we talk to people anymore, you have to start at the ground rule. There's, you can't just assume everybody believes in God or believes in a creator. There's a whole bunch of people who believe that stuff just happened. And so I, 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 I do my best to <coughs> challenge their thought process. For example, how many of you think that this bench right here, this altar, we had some fabric and we had some boards and we put them up in the baptismal and we left them there for about 10 years. Just random stuff that was just piled in there. And we, we went in and looked the other day and boom, this, this had assembled itself. No way. You guys not buying that? No. no. Wow. You guys are a hard, hard lot. <laughs> what about that chair that you're sitting on? Did it? Did somebody have to build that? Yes. That chair is not very complicated. It's not very complicated, but your logical mind tells you somebody had to do that. Look at creation. So, those same people that will not believe that that just happened will tell you that a world that is infinitely more so intricate just happened. You have to suspend your logical thinking process to buy that. That it just happened. We, as human beings, incredibly complex. You know, as we were up there for Rusty's surgery, and uh, the anesthesiologist came in, and he was sharing all the kind of the, all the improvements. Now, now they put a, a thing into your artery so they know what your blood pressure is spot on. It's not waiting for the cuff to register or anything. I mean, they know. And then they run another thing down your throat, and it and it it tells you what each chamber is doing, not just your heart as a I was like, wow, in the last five years, there have been incredible, incredible improvements in what they can watch and do and know and, and to see how complex we are. You are not an accident. You didn't just happen. You were created by a heavenly being. So there is a creator. He says, no one will be without excuse. So when you're looking for things, you have to have, A, the right map. The right map. You know, when we traveled, you'd get those state maps, and it always seemed like you had every state but the one you were in. Oh, man. So then you buy the Rand McNally, the big one. And you didn't have room for luggage because you, your trunk was full of this map. <laughs> and uh, you had to have a map reader and they're helping you. Um, so you have to have the right map. And I believe the right map 
is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to base my worldview on the Word of God because I believe it has proven to be true. So, you have to have the right map. Secondly, it's good to have a current map. A current map. You know, you get one that's, if you got a map of Des Moines that's like 70 years old, you're going to have some issues. Because there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't 235. Some of those roads that would show up on that old map now are dead ends. They're not going to get you to the right place. See, God gave Abraham a map into his presence, and he gave Moses and the children of Israel a map in how to connect with him. And I talked to a guy a couple weeks ago who still is wanting to run off of the old map. He's wanting to run out of the old covenant, out of the Old Testament. He, he, he said, hey, in fact, it's interesting because he doesn't believe that uh, the New Testament has much value and blah, blah, blah. And he's just kind of going down that whole thing. And so I, I asked him, I said, uh, so when did the sacrificial system, I, I'm like, do you, do you still sacrifice then? Because the old covenant demanded sacrifice. So I said, so are you, are you still sacrificing? Well, uh, no. I'm like, why not? Because you're still running under the old covenant. You're still under the old rules, the old laws. You see, as we, you want a current, up-to-date map. To have a map. You know, I, I read a book this past week about a, a young man who died in the wilderness because he wanted to go off and, and whatever, encounter... And he didn't want, he wanted to survive off the land. He didn't want a map. He didn't want a compass. He didn't want any of those things. And he died and he was only three miles from hell. Because he chose ignorance. He chose, willingly made the cho choice to not take the stuff that could have saved his life. Do not willingly choose ignorance. There are people who have the Word of God, and they have willingly chosen to reject it. In fact, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few. Not everybody's going to heaven. Even though there is a map available. There is creation that speaks of a creator that we should worship. There is the Old Testament that points us to a God who created, who loves, and who cares about people. But the current map would be the New Testament, the continuing revelation of who God is. So that we no longer have to function under the old system. Because see, under the old system, you were kind of earning your way to heaven. The new map is about, it will show you how to find that right opening. They have this new thing where they put you, and they lock you in a room. No, I'm not talking about jail. <laughs> they have that too. But they have these things called escape rooms. Escape rooms where you have to, you go in and you try to figure out the clues and all the different stuff so you can get out. And you've got to connect all the right dots and all the right stuff. You know what? The Word of God, God connects all the dots for us. If we'll follow and walk, so you're searching you're searching for something that will fill that emptiness. That map leads to Jesus. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am that door that leads to heaven. <clears throat> what you're looking for is found in Jesus. Is found in Jesus. Is found in a right relationship with Jesus. You know, um, sometimes though, we, in our in our searching process, we find it but don't recognize it. We find the thing, but don't recognize it as what it is. And you're all like, oh, that's kind of confusing. <laughs> Hang on, we'll get there. <laughs> the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah. Right? They were all about finding Messiah, looking for a Messiah, waiting for the Messiah, the one who would come, who would change everything. They were looking for that. They were searching for that. And, and it's interesting because they were searching the scriptures and yet they still missed it. Yeah. When Jesus showed up as the Messiah, they missed it. Because he didn't come like they thought he should. There are people who come to church and come to the Word of God and they miss Jesus because he's not who they think he should be. Jesus said, hey, I am that guy. I am the one that you're looking for. I am the one who will bring you life. And they rejected him because he wasn't what they wanted. He didn't fit their idea of how God should be. You know, my question for you guys is, are you going to allow God to be God? Or are you going to try and shape God into the form and shape that fits your life and what you want? There's a whole lot of people who know about Jesus and have rejected and walked away. The religious leaders, but the one that... Well, and the, so there were the religious leaders. Secondly, to bring to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Good master, what, what must I do to be good? And Jesus said, Keep these commandments. He said, I've done all that since I was young. So he was coming to Jesus to have a God encounter. And Jesus said, well, go sell everything you have and come follow me. And you'll have rewards in heaven. But Jesus asked more of him than he was willing to give. You see, Jesus, as your Savior and your King and as your Lord, asked for you to surrender all. In Matthew chapter 13, we find, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field and got the treasure. He was willing to sacrifice everything that he had to get that treasure. And in case you didn't catch that, he said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, the pearl of great price, he went away and sold almost everything he had and bought. No. He sold a few things. He sold just stuff that he didn't really need. He had a yard sale and sold his extra stuff so he could buy that. No. He had to sell everything, didn't he? It cost him everything. Your salvation cost Jesus everything. And he says, if you want to be my follower, you have to count the cost. You have to be willing to sacrifice everything. You have to be willing to give up 
all of your dreams, all of your money, all of your stuff. That's what he says. If you really, really want to be my disciples, he says, you have to count the cost. And to walk in obedience. But as you begin to do that, This morning, if you had a hundred pennies, you'd walk funny for one thing, but your purse would be really heavy. You had a hundred pennies. You came here and I said to you, listen, if you'll give me those hundred pennies, I'll give you these hundred dollar bills. A hundred of them. I will trade you a penny for a hundred dollar bill. All hundred of your pennies for a hundred dollar bills. Nobody's getting up because A, you don't have pennies, and B, you know I don't have hundred dollar bills. <laughs> okay? But we're talking to a God who is giving you an even better deal than that. Amen. Yes, amen. The stuff that you're holding on to is pennies. And the stuff that he wants to give you is thousand dollar bills. I don't even know if they make those. Does anybody here got a thousand dollar bill? Because if you do, we're taking the offering again. <laughs> you know, I, and I just want to stop saying, hey, Rusty, we're all praying for you. Love you, buddy. Because uh, he watches on Facebook. And he's up in the hospital and uh, just miracles. God, just uh, that whole process. He uses doctors as a part of miracles many times. And sometimes God just shows off and does it himself. And you take a group that's there that shouldn't be there and it'll just be gone. Just be gone. That's what he does. He'll take a bone that's broken and just heal it. Because that's what he does. Because he is the king of kings and lord of lords. When you are searching for a God, look to the God of the, that wrote the word, that gave his son, that sent his son to die for you, who said, I love you. He's not, you know, all these gods in the Old Testament, you see these gods asking the people to sacrifice their children and to do all these terrible things. That's not what our God does. He sent his son to take your place in punishment so that that gap that hole, that place can be filled as we come to Him and walk in obedience. You know, it's... Uh, I was thinking back to also uh, <coughs> Naaman in the Old Testament who had leprosy. Leprosy is kind of a type of, in, in scripturally, a type of sin as a sin correlation kind of thing. So he had, uh, he had leprosy. And there was a little girl who was a servant who had been taken from Israel who said, there's a man in Israel who can heal leprosy. And uh, so they, they sent him to Israel and the king said, what are you thinking? I can't heal leprosy. And Elisha said, uh, send him to me. It's fine, king. I'll take care of this. Because he knew a God. He was a servant of God who followed, who loved God, who made a commitment to follow God. When Elijah said to come follow him, it says that he sacrificed his oxen and he burned his plows. He said, I'm not going back. I'm willing to give whatever up to follow Jesus, to follow the, the Heavenly Father, to have this, this calling, and I'm going to be there. In fact, when Elijah was, when they knew he was going to be leaving, they knew that Elijah was going to be leaving. 
And Elijah said to Elisha, he said, what do you want? What do you want? Hmm. If God said to you this morning, what do you want? If he said to you, what do you want? Because he has the ability to go above and beyond what you ask or think or can even imagine. What do you want? Elisha, Elisha, it was Elijah and Elisha. Elisha said, I want a double portion of what you have. I want the anointing of God to be on my life twice as much as it was on your life. Elijah goes, well, that's a big deal. That's a, that's a tough one. He says, but I'll tell you what. If you see me when I go, it's yours. And then Elijah did with Elisha like you do your kids at Walmart. He tried to hide from me. You guys don't do that? Uh, yeah, see, uh, you guys are... I need to teach a parenting class on my own for you guys. <laughs> I told my children, listen, it's your job to keep track of me, not my job to keep track of you. And then I would try to hide from them. I'd be like, oh, I'm going down around the corner. <laughs> they always found me. <laughs> always found me. Elijah kept trying to get away. He says, listen, I'm going to go over here and you stay here. Elijah said, no way. I'm going to go over here and you stay here. No way. <laughs> he couldn't get rid of him. They crossed the river. And then the chariot of God came. And Elijah went up. And as he went up, his cloak, thank you, fill in the blank there. Let's say his robe, but no, that wouldn't be good either. His cloak. I don't know, going to heaven, you get a new robe. It's all good there. His cloak dropped. And Elisha picked it up. And the anointing was upon him because he chose to follow God. Because he chose to stick close. Because he wouldn't give up. So, Naaman shows up at his door. Naaman shows up at his door and... Uh, to get healed of leprosy. The impossible thing. And uh, his expectations were that Elisha would come out and do some grand thing. They'd wave flags and do stuff. and Or that he would send Naaman off to do some heroic deed. Elisha didn't even go out to see him. And I thought about that. I thought, why was that? Why did God have Elisha? Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe Elisha was watching The Price is Right. <laughs> He's like, uh, yeah, just go out and tell him what to do. I'm busy here. Fixing lunch. I don't know. He had something in the oven. I don't know what was going on, but I think part of it was he didn't want to get the glory, he wanted God to get the glory. Yeah. And he said, David, just go bathe how many times in the river? Seven. Seven times in the Jordan River. Go bathe seven times in the Jordan River. The servant went out, and Naaman was furious because it wasn't like he thought it should be. I'm just telling you guys, in your walk with God, there's going to be a lot of times it's not going to be like you thought it would be. When God shows up, it's not going to be what you thought always. It's not going to be in the loud voice. It's going to be in the little whisper in the middle of the night. Yes. It's going to be that as you're reading through the Word, that that one scripture will just jump up. You'll be like, God, you just spoke to my heart. Hallelujah. It will be like that, but... For the miracles to take place, you have to walk in obedience. Naaman had to make a choice. And, and he, got his, he, he got all wound up. He's like, blah, 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 blah. There's better rivers back.
back home. I'm not just, he was just, ah. He was all wound up. And he was about to go back home with leprosy. See, this morning you are here and you have an opportunity to have Jesus Christ forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Or you can say, but it's not how I thought it would be and go home just like you came. But thankfully, there was somebody sitting just down the pew from Naaman <laughs> who said, don't be an idiot. This is a chance of a lifetime. This is the opportunity. You're going to get one shot at this, buddy. Now, surround yourself with wise people. He had good servants who actually cared about him. He obviously was a good guy. And they said, they took a risk. And they said, don't be an idiot. If he asked you to do some grand and noble thing, would you have done it? Yes. Well then, let's just try to simplify. See, sometimes salvation, we struggle with it because it's so simple. It's so simple. We pray a prayer and ask Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't go do some grand heroic thing. We don't. We simply accept the gift of salvation. Naaman said, fine. Fine. And they went to the river. And they dipped once. And I'm thinking he still had leprosy. And he dipped twice. And he dipped three times. And four. And then five. And maybe it was getting a little smaller. But I think if he had only dipped six times, he would still had leprosy. He had to, to walk clear in obedience. And he dipped that seventh time, and he came up clean. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. Healed. It was gone. Totally, completely gone. Bow our heads this morning. What are you searching for? Are you content to just take the broad path that leads to destruction? Are you content to just choose what you believe, to pick and choose and not really allow the Word of God to change and transform? Are you shaping and forming God according to what you want Him to be? Or are you, simply, are you going to simply come and surrender? Come and say, I surrender all. God, I give up. I'm going to surrender. I have this, this leprosy of sin in my life. And I need it to be gone because it's killing me. It's destroying my relationships. It's destroying my life. I have no peace. I have this emptiness inside. I'm searching. I'm searching for something that will give me peace and a purpose for my life. He is that one. Jesus. Jesus. The name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. This morning, if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to set you free, I just invite you to slip up your hands and say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I need Jesus to do what only he can do. I need Jesus to forgive my sins and set me free. This morning, you get to make a choice. Just like Naaman made a choice. It wasn't what he thought it should have been. But it was what God demanded. What God called for. You're like, I don't know. 
I don't know everything. I don't understand it. It doesn't matter. Come and see. Come and see. That's what Philip said to Nathaniel. Come and see. You don't have to go home like you came. There is a creator of heaven and earth who loves you, who wants to set you free and break the bondage. And a bunch of you have had that take place in your life. You pray, said Jesus, forgive my sins. Change my heart, change my life. And the presence of God showed up that filled that spot. And as you walk with him daily, he continues to fill that spot. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. What are you searching for? Sometimes we're searching for things that are already right there. that he paid for our sins to be forgiven. He made it so simple. Don't go home with the same leprosy that you came with. God, let me pray for you, Heavenly Father. Jesus, the God who breaks every chain. Jesus, Lord, I pray for each one who is here this morning that they will come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they will allow you to own and command all of their love and all their stuff. Jesus, we surrender to you. set us free. You make all things new. Lord, this week, we want to serve you. We want to walk with you. We want to have your presence surrounding our hearts, our minds, everything that we do. Lord, we pray for rest in Jesus that you'll continue to heal. We pray for our, our nation, for our president, for our leaders. Jesus, you will speak in their hearts. You will protect them. You will Lead them in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, we just love you. We need you every hour. 